Well, good morning. It's time for church at Calvary Assembly of God. It's kind of an unusual Sunday, isn't it? Being online and all, but we're thankful that you're here. And we're thankful that we're going to have a great Sunday together. And so I'm encouraging you to sit back and enjoy and listen to what God would say to all of us today at Calvary. Let's go on inside. Well, we made it into the sanctuary on this great Sunday morning, and we want to take a little time to just worship the Lord and look to Him in many different ways. So right now, let's start with Pastor Josh and Emily and the worship team and lift our voices and our hearts to the Lord Jesus in worship and song. Lord, we choose to worship you. Lord, we choose to make this our story and our song, your goodness. Lord, in all the places that we are this morning, would you be lifted up? Would you fill every home, every place with your glory? Thank you, Jesus, for being with us. Let's sing Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory to salvation yes we are the purchase of God I'm born of the spirit washing this hallelujah we sing this is this is my story this is my
voice and sing with us. Just the voices sing. This is this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. When we praise you, you come and make your throne upon our praise. Lord, you are here, Lord. Every place that you are invited, you come, Lord, and you fill. Thank you, Jesus. Here as we wait, here as we wait, seek your face, come and make your throne upon our praise, here in this place, have your way, the moment that we see you, we are changed. Show us. Show us your glory. Show us your glory. In wonder and surrender we fall down. Show us your glory. Show us your glory. Let every burning heart be holy. Here, not by here, not by power, not by might, but only by the cross we come alive. Here, we're undone, overcome by heaven's love revealed before. Show us 
right where you're at this morning, would you ask Jesus and say, Jesus, make this holy ground. Jesus, make my home holy ground. Lord, make this place where I'm meeting with you holy ground. Lord, a holy place for you are here. You are here. You are welcomed. Speak to our hearts, Holy Spirit. Touch us, comfort us, challenge us. Holy Spirit, we give you free reign to do what you will in our homes and our lives. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we know as we invite you, you will reveal your glory. We thank you, Jesus. Be praised this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Josh and Emily, worship team. It is, it's good. It is good when we lift our voices and our hearts and we praise the Lord. Worship brings us close to God. Well, give me a moment to just talk to you a little bit about what's going on at Calvary this week and the weeks to come. I want to start by simply welcoming you and thanking you for being part of Calvary Assembly of God. Uh, this is a church that I believe God is using greatly in our network of churches and the Assemblies of God in New Jersey in the nation, but as well as this state that God is using us as a lighthouse among many others, but using us greatly. So God bless you for being part of Calvary Assembly of God. Perchance, if you're a visitor here this morning, now typically on a regular Sunday morning, what I would do is I would simply say to you, I'd say, hey, can you finish, after the service is finished, go out into our foyer, find our welcome table, and, and talk to the people there. But obviously, we're online only this morning. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do instead. Send me a text. And here's the number right on the screen. You can't miss it. 973 833-3100. Send me a text and simply tell me your name. That's it. Maybe a little background. Uh, this is my first time visiting, my second, third time. I'm just a, I'm a new person at Calvary. Just wanted you to know I'm here, Pastor. Uh, I've never filled out a card before and just wanted to say hello. Fill that out. Send it to me so I can send you a welcome text and even a welcome video for being here. So once again, to all our visitors this morning, Welcome. Well, what happens during the week at Calvary Assembly of God? We have something called midweek services. And that service is so critical to kind of getting us through the week and moving forward. We have life groups, which we encourage you to attend, and then this one called midweek service. That night, we have three major arms that happen at, in it. We have the adult Bible study. We have Royal Rangers, which are for our young men, our boys and young men. And then we have girls' ministries for our for our girls and, and young women, encouraging you to come out on Friday night, we call uh, Wednesday night, we call it family night. So be with us every Wednesday night. Well, as you know, this is a very unusual Sunday morning because it's, we're not in the sanctuary, we're online. And obviously that was because of the major event that's happening literally across the street. I could throw a stone across, a uh, golf ball, I guess, across the street and hit it. It is a major, and it would cause major trouble as far as getting into our church. So we have the capability, the thrill to be able to share this morning this way. And just remember that one of the things we wanted you to do was after you finish the online experience of, of worship and the preaching of the word and everything, that you do not forget to maybe fellowship today. And so invite someone out for lunch, have them over for a picnic. I would assume you've already planned this, but... See what you can do if you didn't. Last, second, spontaneous is fun too. So do some spontaneous if you need to. But I encourage you, just don't watch church. Be church. Come together with the rest of those in our church. Hey, did you know that it was this Friday night we're going to have our marriage night? These marriage nights are fantastic. They are top quality. Uh, once the word gets out of this, I'm surprised this whole sanctuary and isn't filled and we have to do two of them in a row just to fill it, uh, just to see it work. So I'm encouraging you to come to marriage night. 
Right now, we're going to ask Pastor Josh and Emily to give us some more information about this Friday night's marriage night. Thank you, Pastor B. Yes, it's just five days until the next marriage night here at Calvary. It'll be Friday, June 30th at 7 p.m. And we hope that every married couple watching this will be there. We believe here at Calvary that marriages are so important and that's why we have this vital ministry where we encourage every couple to come to carve out this special night to say, honey, I want to build our marriage. I want to keep on showing you that you matter and I want to keep on learning so that we can together serve Jesus the way that he's always wanted to. That's right. We're going to start off that night at seven o'clock with some ice cream sundaes and some other treats in the lobby. And then we are going to move into the sanctuary for a different kind of feeding for every marriage. Yes. When we have these nights, we also take the time to hear from God's Word because we believe that God's Word is true and He's the one that designed marriages. He knows how to keep a marriage strong. And so when we sit and learn from what the Word of God says, we know that from doing that, our relationships, our own hearts with the Lord will grow strong. And then in that, our love for one another can grow deeper into the way God wants it to be. Yes, it does. Yes, it will. All right, so here's what you do. You'll see a QR code right now coming up on your screen. In order to sign up for the marriage night, just use your phone and uh, highlight that QR code. Or if you can't do that, then just text the number on the bottom of the screen that you are coming. Include your name and your spouse's name. Maybe some of you have already signed up in the lobby, and so if you have, we're looking forward to seeing you there. But if you haven't, make sure you sign up and let us know, because this is it, the last Sunday to sign up before this Friday's marriage night. So there it is. We're looking forward to seeing all those married couples there this Friday night. Yes, feel free to invite another couple as well. But otherwise, we will have a great time. All right. Back to you, Pastor B. Well, that sounds exciting to me. Thank you, Pastor Josh and Emily. We're going to move forward with that. So I encourage you, be part of Marriage Night. Sister B and I will be here, be there. I'm encouraging you to be there. Finally, I want to thank you for your faithful giving. Faithfulness to the house of God, the storehouse where you call home. That's, that's where we tithe. We don't tithe anyplace else but where we call our home church. We can give offerings to other places, but our 10% goes to our home church. We need to keep that correct understanding in our minds. And then, of course, we go beyond that. And one of the things that we do as a church and we believe has made us a great church is that we give to missions. And so this is what our missions faith promise card looked like uh, here just a couple months ago when we had our missions convention and missions emphasis. So thank you for giving. I am so... In so blessed that the number of missionaries and missions projects that we have been giving to recently that have resulted in dozens and scores of people being saved because of our faithfulness. So thank you for it. Let's take a moment and pray the blessing over the offering. Heavenly Father, thank you that God, there is a promise in the Word of God in your Bible that says, well, first of all, there's a commandment. It says give and give this way. Give your tithe. Give that, that which you believe in because you know God has put it on your heart like missions. And Lord, then we thank you for the promise that connected to our obedience that says you will bless and you will take care of and you will minister and you will be in the lives. You will keep Satan from becoming the devourer in our lives and you will, Lord Jesus, be our provider. And we thank you for that. So, Lord, we ask today that your blessing is on the gift, on the giver, on, Lord Jesus, their lives. Thank you again, Jesus. We pray in your wonderful name. Amen. Once again, thank you for your giving. Well, then, we are going to jump right into our sermon right now, and this ought to be a lot of fun. I'll tell you, if you look at the title, uh, I, I, I'm sure you saw the title. But now look at the, the picture with the title. So here's how it starts out. What do you need to do in your life 
to have it come to a place where your best friend in the world is a pig. Well, that's what the center person of our sermon this morning did. The best friend he had in the world at one moment in his life was nothing but a pig. And in fact, as the title says, coming back to the Father is not just for the guy we're, we're preaching about today, but it is really a call to all of us. Because in one way or another, we always need to refocus our hearts, always need to pray that prayer, search me, O God, and see if there be anything in me. Whether I'm in church or I'm far away from church, Lord, always search me, always help me, always let me be the man, woman of God you want me to be and should be. Draw me close, draw me back to, let me come back to the Father. And so today, once again, I welcome you to this very unique service here at Calvary online only as we spend some time together and we share the Word of God. Don't forget your picnic right after this service. Luke, the 15th chapter, and only verse 11 says this. Then Jesus says, once, once. I want to tell you a story, like a once upon a time, but here it's not a fairy tale. I want to tell you a story about there was a father who had two sons. Let's talk about this family this morning. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that the message that is shared this morning will touch our hearts. Lord God, all of the Word of God is meant to touch our hearts, but it's always really amazing when we read this part of the Word of God and we read this particular parable or set of parables, Lord, that really just kind of, they, they hit a home run and they, they strike a bell inside our hearts. So Lord, help every one of us to today, 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 come back to the Father in any way and every way we need to. We pray in Jesus' name, and of course, by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. In Luke, the 15th chapter, Jesus tells, Jesus tells us a, um, well, he tells us three parables in a row. And when he tells us these three parables in a row, it's parable on top of a parable on top of a parable, and they all have to do with the same thing. Not often does Jesus do that. Jesus gives us three stories in a row to talk about being lost. A sheep, a coin, and a son. A sheep, a coin, and a son. I'll tell you, for those who think you can't be lost once you receive your salvation, you've got to quit skipping over Luke 15. I mean, this talks about it big time. So one of them was a sheep that wanders off. A sheep that wanders off. The shepherd leaves the 99. He's got 100 sheep, but he leaves the 99 who are not lost, and he goes looking for the one that is lost. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, the Bible says this, we are all like sheep. Sheep wander, and we all are like sheep. Then the second one, the second story he told was a story of a lady who had 10 valuable coins. I don't know what, um, I don't know whether it's silver coins, what, what were the value of the coin. I would just, I'm going to assume they were gold coins because they were such high value. Each coin is a high value and yet one of them gets lost. One of them gets lost. It's interesting, a coin doesn't have a, a, a will and a mind and a, and a desire to do it. But he just, this coin just ends up lost. And in many ways, you and I are like a coin. We were just born lost. We were born in sin. We were not born and then uh, to, with God and then ran away from God. But the Bible says by what happened right all the way from the Garden of Eden, we were, we were born in sin, born lost. And because we were born lost, we were separated from God. Yet... Like, just like the parable, Jesus came to seek and to save those which were lost. Seek and save, that's what the name of that great, great outreach was just a couple weeks ago. Seek and save. But then the third parable that Jesus told, and that's the one that I want to focus on this morning. And it hits close to home, so, I mean, you know, I'll I tell you what, like I prayed in the beginning, all the Bible is for all of us. But there are certain parts of the Bible, when you read it, you just automatically feel a connection. And Luke 15 is a huge one. 
Here is one that hits so close. It's a father and two sons. And the two sons, even though they appear to be as different as night and day, and in many ways they were different, but in many ways they were the very same. The parable becomes important to us because of the perspective of the three individuals that are mentioned there. We talk about the father in that family, then we talk about the older son, and we talk about the younger son. In many different ways, you and I are sometimes like the father. We have someone who is lost, someone who we love so much, and yet they are, they are lost, and we're worried about them, and we're thinking of them, and we're watching for them to return to the household. And, and that's, that'll often happen. If you're a Christian, you'll have people in your life who wander away from Jesus, all we like sheep. And when that happens, you, it, will, it will rip out your heart and cause you to watch for them. But then sometimes we're like the older son. And what is it about that older son? That older son, I'll tell you, something happens. We need to search our own hearts and see if we are bitter at obeying the father. If we are bitter about staying and living in his house. Or to put it in the clothes of Christianity to see if you and I are bitter about obeying the Bible. Uh, that's, a, I mean, that, that's a sermon. I mean, I'm going to be preaching on the younger son this morning, but that's a sermon right there. Forget the younger son. Hey, you're in the Word of God. You're in the house of God. But is your heart there? And that's what we talk about. That's what we, when we look at the older son. He was there, uh, but he wasn't there. He was there, but his heart wasn't there. You see, you and I are called by God to live in the house of God and in his house and walk in his ways. So I'm just going to say to you just plainly, and it, it, if it needs to be a correction, let it be that. Never despise the great privilege we have to obey the word of God and to live or to participate in the house of God. Never say, oh, no, not again, and on and on and on. And, oh, the grass is greener on the other side of the fence where their sin is and everything else. Don't do it. You have a high and holy calling. In fact, 1 Peter, the second chapter, verse 9, really is our verse. It's, it's the household of faith verse where it says, but you are not like that. You are a chosen people. You are a royal you are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he has called you out of darkness and called you into wonderful light. So to all us older sons, let's make sure that we make that strong decision to walk in the light, to walk with the Father and love every minute of it. But what we want to focus on here this morning is the younger son. And he's called the prodigal, but we'll simply call him the younger son. We're just going to simply say he's a son. He made a decision. Let's see what that decision brought him and how he needed to change that decision. So number one, it was time to make your own decision. It's time to make your own decision. You know, that time comes in your life. It must actually come in every person's life. Somebody else makes a decision. Somebody else does this. Somebody else does that. But now it's time for you to make a decision. It says in Proverbs, the 14th chapter, verse 12, there's a way of life that looks harmless enough. But hey, look again. Look again. That way of life that looks harmless enough. Uh-uh. Look again. It leads straight to hell. Jesus tells the parable of the prodigal son by telling the story of what you and I might consider a typical family. Hey, here we've got a father, we've got two sons, and obviously uh, we're going to have to guess that there was a mother someplace in, the, in this story. Now, if we could see their whole life, I mean, the whole thing, we'd see, I don't know, a photo album. Most of us have photo albums of our, of our families that we have on the shelf somewhere. Uh, probably black and white photos, in fact. And uh, there would be the old Plymouth station wagon in that in those photos, taking family vacations and loading up in the station wagon and rolling the windows down and heading out with, with homemade sandwiches and, and all the things that go with a vacation and the two boys in the back seat and mom and dad in the front seat. And of course, if that's going to be the way it is, then the two boys in the back seat are fighting each other and the dad in the front seat's just getting really upset and really mad and keeping telling them to settle down and everything. But that's, that kind of goes with a family vacation road trip. 
But years pass. Things move on. It's not the same anymore. Kids, the boys now become teenagers. They become young adults. And soon enough, soon enough, they become adults on their own. And what happens when they become adults on their own? It is time for them to make their own decisions. Yesterday, you told them. They were your children. So you told them that they need to love Jesus. Yesterday, you told them, but today, they need to make that decision all on their own. And here's the reality of it. Sometimes they go off in a different direction. Uh, I, I, listen to what I'm saying here. It was good that the prodigal son made his own decision. Now, I'll say right away it wasn't the right decision, but that he came to a point in his life where he realized, I've got to make a decision for my own life. This teaches us a lesson. It teaches us that you must make your own personal decision. You can't wait for somebody else whether you're going to follow Jesus or not. I must, you must make your own decision for Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus needs to be your song, not just the song somebody else sings. Your song. I have decided. It's my theme song because I have decided to follow Jesus. That decision as to whether or not you're going to follow Jesus. Maybe when you were a kid, mom and dad had that persuasiveness to get you to go that direction. Maybe your brother or sister and their influence had that influence on you. Or, or maybe even your wife or husband is pushing you in that way or encouraging you that way. But I have to say it again. No matter how many wonderful people we have around us, it all comes down to this. We've grown up. It's time to make my own decision. The prodigal made a decision. It wasn't the right one, but he made a decision. But I commend him for making a decision. Now we're going to try to get that decision changed. But in the meantime, he stood up and he said, this is my decision. What is your decision for Jesus today? Make a decision and then move forward. But I'm hoping and I'm trusting and I'm believing and I'm praying that it's a decision for Jesus. The younger son said, I've made my decision, Dad. Okay, son, what is it? I'm walking away from you and the house and everything. As the parable is supposed to teach us, that's not just this son walking away from his father, but it is a man or a woman walking away from God. That's what the Bible's trying to tell us right there, of saying it. And you know, it's interesting. Sometimes people will say, well, I, I, I'm not walking away from God. They say it, but the way they live says the other thing. They've actually lived out a walk away from God, even though they somehow have figured out how to say it right, they live it wrong. Make sure you not only say it right, but you live it right. He had time. It was time to make a decision. Now, number two, number two, and this is, this is super important here. After we make our decision, do you realize what a decision is? You have to live with your decision. You have to live with the decisions you make. That's why you were encouraged to make the right decisions because if they take us to the wrong place, we may end up with what we never intended to have. And so here we go. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, speaking of Moses, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. That verse that says for a season, what it's saying is, take note. And, and this is important. Sin will seem pleasurable for a season. And listen, even a rat will think that the rat poison tastes good when he is eating it. I mean, that's pretty much the equivalent right there. The prodigal son leaves his father, and he's got a chunk of change that is pretty big. He has got a lot of money. He is cash, cash rich for the moment. How much did he get? I don't know in today's terms what, what number, 50,000, 250,000, a million. I don't know what number he had. All I know is on the short term, and that's an important word right here, a phrase, short term, he could get anything his heart desired. He could, all he had to do was think of it, 
and his cash could buy it. So he did that. You know, we talk about how miserable the prodigal son was after all his money was gone. We say, oh man, after his money was gone, life turned bad. You know, I'd like to say something different here. We need to talk about how miserable his life was when he still had plenty of money. Money, or sin, may dull the pain of being away from the Father, but it never erases the pain. What did the son have? He had shallow friendships, dirty companionship, cheap drink, empty entertainment, and that's what the Bible called riotous living, but they could never equal the peace that you get from being in the Father's house. John 14, 27, Jesus stated it very plainly, very clearly. He says these words, I am leaving you with a gift, the peace of mind and heart. And the peace that I'm giving you as a gift is a gift the world cannot give you. You cannot leave the Father's house and find it somewhere else. The Father's love, the Father's protection, the Father's hand, and say, I'll get better someplace else. It does not happen, Jesus says. The world cannot give that. So don't be upset that you're in, in God's house. You got it as good as you could, as good as beyond good. Uh, so don't be troubled or afraid. So here it is. This man, this younger son, experienced true emptiness. Not when he was in the pig pen. Oh, well, in the pig pen too. But he experienced it the very moment he left the father's house. This next slide I want you to look at with me, please. And I'm, and I'm going to, uh, sometimes I say to you, hey, there is, a, there is a highlight slide of the entire sermon or the entire day. Well, I'm going to make this today's highlight slide. The true curse was not the pig pen. The true curse was being separated from the love, provision, and protection of his loving father. Do you know what this, this represents? Do you know what? We say hell is full of fire and torment and darkness, and that's bad, and oh my, and everything else, and, and we, we emphasize that as hell. You know what really makes hell hell? Being separated from God's love and God's face forever and ever and ever. True emptiness True emptiness is not being without money. True emptiness is out without being without the Father. Number three. Number three. So he made his decision. He had to live with his decision. But did you know, did you know, you can change your decision if it was the wrong one? Actually, you can change it if it's the right one, which is sad. Some people do. They make the right decision, then they change it to the wrong. But let's just stay with this. He made the wrong decision, but he could, he could fix it. So here we go. When he finally came to his senses, Luke 15, 17, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. Here I am just dying of hunger. I, I'll say it often. One of your best verses in the entire Bible is right there in front of you because when a man's eyes were blind and they are opened, when a man was lost and now he all of a sudden realizes he can be found, oh my, oh my, how wonderful it is when blindness is taken away and truth is revealed. In Pentecostal Christianity, we call that a Holy Ghost revelation moment. The moment the Holy Ghost gets a hold of your heart and a man or woman sees themselves for who they are and how great it would be to ask Jesus to come into their hearts, to give their hearts to Jesus. All of a sudden, the prodigal starts thinking about the days that he was in the father's house. And oh my, oh my, he realizes that he has made a foolish decision. A decision that has separated him from all that was good. The worst position in his father's house was leaps and bounds better than where he was at that moment. Even leaps and bounds when he had the money. All of a sudden, he came to his senses. You know, I have to wonder if he just kind of laughed at himself and, what were you thinking? How stupid can you be? 
I mean, this, what, were you, what did you think? And he slapped himself on the head and on and on. But here's the interesting thing about this moment of revelation. At that moment of revelation, he never dreamed that he could actually go back and be restored as a son. He only thought he could go back and maybe become uh, the lowest of the servants, but have better life than, a, than pig pen. Because at least he'd be back in proximity with the father. And so he's thinking to himself, he's saying, well, I'm just going to go back. And as he does that, he kind of rehearses this little saying or this little, what he's going to say to the father, father, I don't deserve to be a son. Obviously, we all know that. Please let me just be a servant in your household. And honestly, in the natural, in the natural, the way things add up, if we use the word fair, you know, sometimes we use that word fair way too much. Was it fair that Jesus died for my sins and yours? That was not fair, but Jesus did it. Sometimes fair is not really what we want. What we want is God's love. And he, it would have been fair for that father to say, what, what are you talking about? You got your inheritance. You got your portion. It's not like we cheated you or anything. You got what, everybody, what, what your other son... Whether your brother will get, and on and on and on. But see, that's not what happened. That's not what happened. And here's the irony of it all. He missed how much his father loved him. He never grasped, and that's why he left. He left because he didn't know his father loved him so much. That's one of the great tragedies of this story. The son had a father who loved him, and the prodigal didn't even realize it. Up to that moment... He lived his life not fully understanding that his dad, dad loved him more than, love, than life itself. I wonder, because it's the truth of the parable that Jesus is sharing with us, I just have to ask for you and I, do we really grasp the full love that God has for us? Or are we always setting conditions? Are we always saying, yeah, God can't love me because, and then we, I don't know, whatever, we, we, we put in some other condition because I'm this, I'm that, I've done this, I've done that, just who I am, just my personality, just my situation in life, just my family, just what I, on and on and on and on and on. on. And we literally, like the, like the prodigal son, miss the greatest revelation of our lives, the Father loves us more than life itself. You know, if I had never been a parent, if I'd never been a father, I really wouldn't get this. Not at all. But I'll tell you, parents have a measure of God-like love. Uh, you know, and how do I know that? Because they tend to still love their wayward and rebellious children. Amazing. Where, where does that come from? That's not natural. That's God-like love. And here's what the Bible says, if we as earthly parents, Jesus said this in one way, but if we as earthly parents know how, our, how to love our children, then how much more our heavenly Father loves us. The son starts the long journey home. He comes to the final hill. He comes over the hill, and there in the distance, what does he see? You know, you know, you know. He sees the Father. Now, you and I might say, wow, what a coincidence that the father happened to be there looking for his son when he just came over the hill at that moment. Uh -uh. No, no, here's the truth. The moment that son left, the father st started watching for him. The father was watching the whole time he was gone. Again, we need to understand how big the love of God is, how great the love of God is. Oh, you know, you might look at that story and you might say, man, that kid was lucky to have such a dad like that. Well, if we're going to use that term, then let me tell you who's luckier, you and me. Because we have a dad like that in heaven. And greater than that, in fact. You see, we have a father who... The prodigal son was foolish. And you and I aren't, we are. But the Father loves us. The Father calls us back. 
where you would expect to find a beating. You know, you would figure that dad would take a stick to that boy and say, well, okay, but I'm going to need to teach you a lesson. Nah, -uh. where you'd expect to find a beating. Instead, you find the father's arms around the son. I'll tell you, he that was lost is now found. He that was dead is now alive. Jesus told that parable in Luke 15. Remember, there were three parables. The sheep, the coins, the lost son, or the sons. And take note, when Jesus told the one about the sheep, he said, when they found the sheep, then that when he brought the sheep back, he called all his friends and said, hey, let's rejoice over this one. And so it says in Luke 15, 7, in the same way there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents and returns to God than 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. And we tend to use this verse uh, in the context of a brand new person, a brand new uh, a sinner becoming a Christian first time. That's how we tend to use that verse. And obviously it does, it does apply to that. But strictly speaking, it actually applies to the one who has strayed away from God and come back to God. The one who has left the Father's house, left him and not stayed close to him. Let me say this as we close this here today. In any way in your life, have you strayed from God? I'm not gone from the house, maybe like the older son, still in the house, still, still reading your Bible, or, or maybe, because remember, this isn't about what's on the outside. It is, obviously, because if the inside's right, the outside reflects it. But the outside being one way doesn't make the inside another way. It has to start, this is the best way to say it, it has to start on the inside so it can be correct on the outside. It can't be from the outside to the in. It has to be inside to the out. So I don't want to talk about your outside and what you do or don't do. Let me just go right straight to your heart. Where's your heart with God? Where's your heart with God? Again, the Bible says there was great rejoicing in heaven when one returns to where they should be with God. So I'd say this morning, let's have some Let's have some great returning to God. Let's, let's get heaven really rejoicing this morning. Let's every one of us search our own hearts. While, when I get ready to pray in just a moment, and I pray, search your own heart. Don't wait for some, don't think of somebody else. What, what a cop out. Don't think of somebody else. Think of yourself and where you are and ask God to help you bring your heart back. Remember, it wasn't the pig pen that was the emptiness, it was being away from the Father. In that area of his life, in any area of life, in our lives, in any area, there will be an emptiness till we come back to the Father. Let's come back to him. Bow your heads with me, please. Lord, help us to understand better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Help us to have a heart that says, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Lord, help us to want to be with the Father. Now help us, Jesus, to, by your Holy Spirit, search our hearts. As you know our hearts, may we have a Pentecostal moment of revelation to know who we are and where we are and what's going on and, and the motives behind what we have said and done and lived. And I pray, Jesus, you would change us till we get that moment where we say, we come to our senses. And Lord, we say, uh-oh, this part of my life needs to get back to God. And so, Heavenly Father, in your name, I pray that every person, as their head is bowed now, and they're just waiting in your presence, has their own Jesus moment, their own talk with God, their own lifting their feet out of the mud and walking to the end, edge of the pig pen and then finding the road that leads home and start the long, long walk home. But Lord Jesus, the closer we get, the more energy comes into us, the more excitement, the, the lighter our steps get, because we're going to be back to the Father. And finally, God, give us the revelation of how much you love us. Not just a little. Not, I, I know, God, there is, there is judgment and righteousness, and, and we are very aware of that. And we want to be aware of that. It causes us to understand and have the fear of God. But, 
But God, we don't want to have that and be lopsided and not know your love. How much you love us. How much you wait for us to return. So right now, Lord Jesus, may those, everyone, I, I'm just going to say everyone, return in one way or another to the Father in a great way. Holy Spirit, work that now, work it today, work it this week, this month in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hey, you know what every sermon should do? It should give us a game plan on how to walk with God and talk with God. And I, I trust that sermon did. Now, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to make sure, I'm going to ask you to make sure you don't forget or just it comes and, and like the Bible says, we look at our face in a mirror and then we walk away and we forget. I hope that's not the sermon. We forget, but we live it out. Live it out. Remember what I said before. The, the younger son, uh, you know, he, he, he made a very outward decision. The older son, he almost made the same decision, but just everything remained the same. We don't want to be the older or the younger. We want to love God. Well, I trust you'll have a great afternoon. Don't forget to get together with somebody. Hey, we'll see you Wednesday night or next Sunday morning. Make sure that you're part of. Don't forget that uh, in every way that the Lord Jesus wants to walk with you and talk with you in every moment through the Holy Spirit. God bless you. You have a great day.